Hello there. Welcome to another Seeing Clearly with Charlotte Giblin. I've got my friend Mary with us today. I promise she won't interrupt too many times though. And she is going to provide very valuable information and anecdotes for today's topic of help and assistance. Receiving it, not necessarily asking for it, how it can affect our perception of self and our identity. But before I dive into all of that fully, for the artistic side of things, this portrait of Mary, my good friend Mary, was done in 2017. And it's one of a few portraits I've done in my beloved palette knife style with all the texture. And here I have also brought together the precision of brushwork. So working with the two different styles, two different techniques, and absolutely love the way that you can get this sense of the layering of time through the skin, as well as the, the real detailed precision with, with the brushwork, especially around the rings. And this painting was accepted into the 2018 New Zealand Portrait Awards, the Adam Portraiture Awards in Wellington, which was splendid. Second time in a row that I'd got in. Um, for anybody interested in my statistics, that 2018, that was the last time I was accepted into a juried art competition or exhibition and not for want of trying either across a huge range of exhibitions and competitions. No, 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 not bitter at all. It's incredibly character building being rejected time after time after time. And that is not what this video is about. But she sits here in all of her painted glory as a reminder of those heady days of when I was still acceptable in the fine art world. Oops. Well, yes, difficult times for artists, those challenges. Anyway, that's not the point. I'm just so over it, clearly. <laughs> so my friend Mary, this was painted six months after she had a stroke. She was in hospital having another procedure. So I suppose the best place she could have been. And, and had a stroke, which was obviously life-changing and very traumatic for her family. The pictures were taken, the reference photographs and the drawings I did. I wanted to try it six months after the stroke, as I said, and I wanted to try and capture her at a point where she was in recovery. But even then, a remarkable lady in her, I think she would have been a mid 60s when she had the stroke. Still, as you can see from the, the finished painting, just how you know she wanted her hair to be just so. She was always impeccable with, with her pearls, always really, really well done, well presented. But she can see, and her husband can see as well, in the expression in her eyes, a slight hesitancy and a lack of confidence. Well, six months previously, she'd had a stroke. <laughs> but the fact that she was even able to pose for these photographs is quite remarkable. And her story of recovery, now she is pretty much fully recovered. It's one of those examples that the doctors involved have said, oh my goodness, this is absolutely incredible. And she's written a book about it. About her stroke recovery and she puts it down to largely a spiritual practice that she'd been very much um, she'd got involved with over the years to really understanding her own intuition her her purpose in life um, understanding that part of her life lesson at this stage was patience and slowing down and recovery and that was a, a big part of the acceptance that she felt of the difficult stages that she needed to go through 
as she was slowly getting getting better. And a sense of humour absolutely never goes amiss in any kind of difficult situation. As we all know, I can remember going to Mary's for dinner. It might even have been within the first year and she was, was pouring wine for us and she had her thumb inside the, the glass so she could tell where the, the wine was going to get before it got to the top of the glass and she'd pour the wine in but completely miss the glass altogether and wouldn't would be wondering why why can't I feel my you know the wet wine on my thumb yet and it's because it was all over the table and she could have a really good laugh about it I mean her vision was really impacted for quite a while after the stroke but she made a recovery and that it's quite remarkable but at the time Mary had spent a life time of being the matriarch, the successful matriarch of a family. Two sons, a husband for over 50 years, and they'd worked together. Husband and Mary had worked for many years running businesses together, a lot of different businesses, very successful. Some of them had created more challenges, but she always rose from the challenges and that obviously prepared her for the recovery from her stroke. But she was one of those amazing women who did everything, very capable, nothing was ever a problem, always positive, always optimistic. You know, she'd put on the, the, the gloves and right, let's get this done. So after the stroke, for the first time in her life, she was suddenly in a situation where she was completely reliant on other people. She couldn't function, she couldn't get through the days without assistance. Now her sons and her husband were more than happy to help. It wasn't even an issue. In fact, they were probably quite glad to be able to repay the many years of, of help that Mary and support Mary had given them, it was just, it wasn't even an issue. But for Mary, this was such a challenge because it really, really went against the identity, the self-image, the perception she'd had of herself for her entire life. And all of a sudden, she wasn't able to take care of other people or help others. And she was worried about being a burden. She wanted to be useful and suddenly she couldn't. And that was an enormous part of the recovery process for her, accepting help where she hadn't wanted to ask for it because this was such a dramatic, traumatic situation out of the blue. But she was put in this position where she needed help if she was ever going to recover. And I've thought about this many times because I don't think this is an unusual situation. Maybe the circumstances, the medical circumstances are unusual. But I can remember my mum when she stopped being able to do her domestic role. She was the housewife who ran the house, brought up my brother and myself, did all the cooking, uh, was very creative, but her domain was the, the household and dad went out and earned the money. And so when she got to a position towards, within the last maybe 10 years of, of her life, where she wasn't able to do as much, she was becoming very weak all of the years of anorexia, also um, painful arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis in her hand, she couldn't grip things. And the, the nervous anxiety, the sort of mental health issues she'd struggled with for her entire life made it difficult for her to plan things without worrying too much. But when she got to a point of acceptance, okay, I need my dad's, I need my dad's help. I need my husband's help. How am I going to feel about that? She really struggled for years 
in changing her role because that had been her identity her entire life that was her purpose that was her job this was her function within the relationship and suddenly she didn't have that role anymore and had to try and find a way of believing and trusting that she was still needed she was still necessary within the relationship she still formed a functional part of the relationship with my dad because we do want to feel useful we want to feel acknowledged we want to feel like we have a, a purpose and it's we don't want to feel like we're a burden for so many different reasons and those issues of identity within a responsibility within the roles that we feel we've assigned to ourselves or have had assigned to us in a domestic situation that can obviously seep into and affect everything we do and i think it's a really important subject to address in relation to our art practice in relation to the way we live our lives are you able to accept assistance and help in all of its forms whether that is financial assistance whether that is advice spoken advice from friends written advice in books advice on videos are you able to embrace it and accept it what happens if the advice creates a negative defensive reaction within you what do you do then even if the advice is meant and the assistance is meant with just the fullness of of love from its source and in the same way it's just a small step to one side if you can receive assistance and help in the same way that maybe you are able to give it out are you also able to receive and allow in love in the same way that you give it out and i know absolutely i was not able to do that there are a couple of stories i want to tell you which explain a little bit more about this topic and how it relates to me and i know most of my experiences are universal even if the textures and flavors are slightly different i'm sure that you will resonate with aspects of these stories and hopefully you're already using this as a mirror to start looking at yourself and maybe monitoring your reactions to what i'm saying and this advice <laughs> <laughs> are you how are you reacting to it so i can remember very clearly and this is going down the avenue of perhaps advice that we don't even ask for because a lot of advice we don't ask for and we're very good at giving people advice aren't we because we don't have to do anything about it we don't have to action it we can see with perspective how someone else is doing things wrong give them advice walk away so sometimes the unsolicited advice can be the hardest to deal with. And I can remember when I was 15 or so, it was the time of the first Gulf War, 1990, and I was absolutely petrified about the prospect of nuclear war, which I think is fair enough. I don't think that's an unreasonable fear to have. I was brought up without a TV. My parents never had a TV and I read voraciously until I was 20 or so and left home to go to art college just absorbed everything and my imagination as a result had developed into this wonderful <laughs> world of possibility and this was encouraged in my in my home a lot of discussions about all kinds of things and definitely an encouragement to pursue my art and music so all of the creative realms were being explored and it gave me a very rich imagination which is not so great when you're alone at night 
and you start worrying about the state of the world and all these things out of your control and it can develop into an, a tsunami of fear. And I've written about this a bit. I developed some very helpful strategies as a teen to help quell my nerves and calm, calm all of those fears so I could actually function. But I can remember saying to my parents at Christmas that year, tearfully, did they think we were actually going to have another Christmas together? I was so convinced of the potential for global obliteration. I was really concerned about that. And my parents reassured me. They thought, you know, let's uh, think more highly of the human race. And I don't think that's going to be an issue, Charlotte. They were correct. But at the time, because I was so worried about this whole issue, I wanted to try and alert some of my friends at school about the problems that the world faced. You know, a lot of my teenage friends were interested in sex and music <laughs> and only that <laughs> and a little bit of school and, you know, Global issues had not particularly entered their, their radar, but the way I was brought up and discussing world affairs and, and reading the newspaper, it was something that was discussed around the dinner table. So I felt I had a duty and a responsibility to alert some of my friends to what was going on, but in a really positive way to say, look, these are the problems, but these are all things we can do about it. Look, we can join these protest groups. We can, you know, I was, I was listing all the different things we could do with a, come on, let's all join together and we can change the world. And I was getting a bit of a muted response. And so I told my mum about this and she said, Charlotte, no, you will never change anybody's mind. You're simply not important enough. Now, you might have sucked through your teeth then. <sighs> Ooh, that's quite a harsh thing for a mother to say to a 15 year old. And she did have some mental health issues, but she was also very honest and filled with love most of the time. And I am so grateful for that truth that she told me. Is at the time, and this is the reaction scenario I was alluding to earlier, I thought, oh, oh no, 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 mother, you don't, I never called her mother. <laughs> you don't know how persuasive I can be. You don't know the power of my positivity and my belief in changing the world. And mm, I think I'm going to prove you wrong. Of course, what I discovered was that she was absolutely correct. But what I realise now, what she was trying to say was, Charlotte, people don't like being told what to do. And that is correct. The only way to implement any lasting positive personal change is for the individual to find their own way there. You can provide a great example of how you believe life could be lived. You can suggest options, but nobody can create lasting change if they've been forced into it or feel that they have been coerced into making that change. And I'm talking, I'm not talking about specific alternative examples where people have been taken into cults or I'm talking en masse. If you really want to change it doesn't help with somebody saying, you need to change by doing this. The individual has to discover the path themselves. And although at the time that was really difficult advice to take on board, I 
understood years later, decades later, just how powerful that assistance has been because it came from a place of love, but I didn't want to be told that I was wrong or the efforts that I was putting towards making the world a better place were all in vain. So why do we resist being told what to do? Is it because it reminds us of authority and we have an instinct to rebel? But what about all the people who don't want to rebel against authority? Does it feel restrictive, like all options are being cancelled? Or is it that we're actually we react against being told what to do because we might be frustrated with ourselves that we hadn't thought of that and that's actually that is the correct avenue for us but we don't want to our ego says no 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 um you should have thought of that yourself so don't take their advice but we'll find another way around to exactly the same thing that is such an interesting concept, the, the notion of rejecting very helpful advice because of our ego. I have countless <laughs> examples of that. And there's one in particular that springs to mind that I want to discuss because it was relatively recently. I'm going to say within the last five years, I was reading excellent book, Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. I'm sure you've heard of it. If you haven't, it's a fantastic, very famous book about the creative process. And she has some really interesting ideas about creativity and tells the story with great pathos and humour. It's a wonderful book, but there are a couple of parts in it which really irritated me. And um, I found myself hesitant about talking to friends about my reaction to this book because she's very famous, incredibly well regarded. And I'd mentioned it to a couple of people. I said, oh, oh, yeah, you know, I felt that about aspects of the book as well. And almost this sense of relief, you know, you are allowed to disagree with anybody's opinion or anything anybody puts forward, no matter how well regarded and how famous and successful they are. But the key point is understanding why you've reacted negatively, because that is all about your personal growth. It has nothing to do with the author, with anybody else. And remembering that the only thing we can ever hope to have any control over is our own action and reaction pattern. That's the only thing we can try and control. So by addressing the reactions, the negative reactions, positive reactions, you never have to worry about, they're splendid, all of them. <laughs> With any negative reaction you have, if you can start looking for patterns maybe understanding where that reaction is coming from can be enormously helpful for you to break that pattern or be aware of it. So for me, in Big Magic, the one section that stood out to me, and I think I did allude to this in the Seeing Clearly book as well, because it was very significant reflection of my own thoughts and behaviour. She suggests that the creative process, if it has a financial burden on it, it can be strangled out of any kind of life. So to release, take your foot off the neck of your creativity, remove the financial burden, do other work, and then allow that creative spirit to breathe. And when I read it, I thought, no, 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 that's not correct. This is not how it's going to be for me. I want there to be a financial burden on all of my creative ventures because this is my path. I want to make all of my money full time from my art, from my writing. 
So I'm different. I'm special. She's not talking about me. I'll show her and the world that this is does not apply to me. Oh boy, was I wrong. And what a fantastic way she was able to phrase that whole huge pressure that we can put on ourselves as creatives. It took me a little while to realise, because of course then the book becomes the scapegoat, doesn't it? Or the person giving advice or the TV show or the parent or whoever gives the advice. If we get bristly, we think, well, they made me feel like this. No, 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 no. <laughs> you made you feel like that. You've just got to work out why. And my ego was really bruised because all of my art practice, all of my work was so tied up with my identity of independence, of wanting to be financially successful, of wanting to be a leading light for other creatives. All of these different aspects of my ego and my identity hung on my ability to be financially successful through my art. So having somebody else suggest that maybe I was going about it the wrong way was very painful because I knew that she was right and I didn't want to see that. And that is just one of many examples. Possibly you're thinking of some yourself, maybe this whole monologue is making your hair go on end and your shoulders go up and you get a twitch. Perhaps it's reflecting something difficult back, hopefully something positive. But all of these different ways in which we react to advice and assistance are critical in our ability to then evolve and move forward. And for me in particular, having adopted the role, and if you've seen any of my videos, you, you're ahead of me, aren't you? Having adopted the role of responsibility for the well-being of others before myself, yes, since I was a young child, having adopted that role, it made it very difficult to fully accept other people's assistance because I was the one who assisted everyone else. I had this incredible wellspring of energy that would just fill me back up any time that I felt depleted because I always needed to be the one who could embrace somebody in need, who could be there at a moment's notice, who could give the words of positivity and strength. And I always could because I had this reserve of energy until it ran out. But because that was my role and that was my identity, so tightly tied together. And when other people tried to give me their help, whether it was financial, whether it was just offering assistance for anything to do with my business, I felt, oh no, 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 I'm, I need to be independent. You save the assistance, the money, the energy for yourself because you probably need it more than I do. I felt guilty about all of the wonderful assistance I'd already been given throughout my childhood and the way that the dice had landed with my chemistry and I felt bad for taking away, almost like people have a certain quantity of assistance and love they can give. Insane notion. But we need to be gentle with ourselves when we realise that we've been carrying these restrictive notions because they all come from very important foundation stones. When you can dig down to those, you can really understand why you have got to the place that you're in now and how long it took me to be able to receive love. And I was always good at receiving compliments, I think, but when it came to purely accepting love in the way that I was able to just dole it out with real sincerity. Again, it was that whole issue of I've got enough, you keep it for yourself. 
And that is incredibly unfair. For the person who desperately wants to express their love and to give their love, and I always had a barrier up. No, 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 thank you, I'm fine. That's a terrible situation to realise that you're creating. It doesn't take a genius, though, to look back through my life path, understanding the emotional support that I gave to my mum from a very early age and this role of responsibility I adopted why my heart was a little bit closed, had a good defensive shield around it. I didn't want to get hurt because I had this job to do. I had this role to play. And so there was a bit of defensiveness and restriction there. I knew that if I fully opened up to receiving love, it meant that I was open to needing people's help. I was acknowledging I couldn't function in the way I wanted to. I couldn't function in the way I thought I ought to without accepting people's help and embracing their unconditional love. It also meant, crucially, I was making myself very vulnerable to any kind of hurt, to the sort of pain and potential loss and grief that comes with love. All of that felt very frightening. Much easier to close it off, have a nice shield around you, just crack on. But what a half-life. And there was a very significant point where I realised that I had fully opened myself up to receiving love. And I've spoken about the changes in my relationship with Pete many times before, but the significant year of 2018, when we were in New Plymouth here in New Zealand, and Pete was finally able to step away from the burden of his very difficult job in hospitality as a chef. And I was able to relinquish some of the domestic roles that I'd started to find quite burdensome, but felt it was my duty, my responsibility to still do them. I think there's often a partner who does an awful other lion's share, let's say. And I was that one, uh, in my mind, I'd taken on too much. And finally, well, our roles changed. And it's what I'd always hoped for but never really dreamed it'd be possible. Because suddenly, Pete was able to take over all the cooking, all the cleaning, oh my goodness. And although sometimes one has to adjust one's standards (laughs) to accept love (laughs) and to accept assistance, delegation, you have to step back sometimes (laughs) from the delegating and realizing how much it's helping and that there's some other compromises you can make. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I was having my meals cooked for me. They were being presented on a plate every evening. This was the most fantastic show of love and gift of love, which I was absolutely fully able to embrace and say thank you for. And to the point that when I go away on my own, with work or yeah but always with work I have to be really careful about the amount of love I will allow myself to give me myself to give myself myself to give me me to give myself you know what I'm trying to say and food has always been because food was my mum's language as well and food is Pete's language for some reason I've struggled with that a little bit And after a couple of days of maybe having peanut butter on toast and raw broccoli, and then I finally think, okay, I'm going to have to get a saucepan out and and cook something. And there was this one brilliant incident. I say that with heavy irony. A few years back, and it was one of those situations Uh, And I thought, I am going to be incredibly healthy. I've learned from my mum, 
who brought us up eating incredibly nutritious meals, partly because of her obsession with food. But I'm grateful for the uh, nutrition, nutritional knowledge that I gained. So I had my steamed vegetables and a few potatoes and some form of protein. And and I was just getting, you know, there was, I didn't even put any seasoning on. You know, there was nothing joyful happening on the plate at all. And then I'd reheated the kale and it lost all its green and it was there on the plate. <laughs> like limp and discoloured. And I was like picking up the kale. Like, this is rubbish. And Pete phoned. Hi, how was your day? And I just burst into tears. I was like, what is going on? <laughs> With the kale. <laughs> and because I hadn't yet, and this was recently, I hadn't yet got to the stage where I automatically would give myself, would allow myself to receive love in that form. I'd allowed that gift of love to be given to me by a number of other people throughout my entire life. But as soon as I was responsible for it, totally different rules. And that's crazy, isn't it? The way that we really often put ourselves last in line when it comes to self-care, giving ourselves love, giving ourselves assistance and advice. And Pete had a really good laugh about the kale. <laughs> and we still mention it. I haven't had it since. I mean, isn't that absolutely crazy? But that was a great indication for me that I still had a fair bit of work to do. And actually, from a physical point of view, I kind of need to make an effort there when I go away and maybe eat out or find somebody to eat with if I really couldn't be bothered to make something nutritious. I think after Kale Gate, uh, I think I did pay a bit more attention and the rest of that week it was all right and there were no more tears over the reheated vegetables. But part of this whole journey of receiving advice and assistance has formed the, the root, the main foundation of everything that I'm passionate about teaching now, which is about removing the masks of illusion and the idea that it is possible to do everything on your own without receiving help. That's absolute load of rubbish. And whatever form of help, even if it's a small, a small part of your life, we all need help, we all need love, we all need comfort, we all need support and assistance in many, many different forms. It's not the same for all of us at all. And I found myself getting so frustrated reading many of the self-help books that I thought were going to give me answers over the years. And I found that they became reflections of what I wasn't able to do. Or I, I thought, but I think in this way, I, I am a positive person. I am tr doing this and this. I'm ticking things off the checklist. But why am I still suffering from anxiety? Or why am I afraid of opening up my heart and being vulnerable. And the sense that one person's advice is right for each of us was also, I think, very misleading. That's why there's so many voices in the, the help community, because we all respond to different words, to different faces, to different concepts. And I think it's really healthy to have a huge number of voices in your life, whether it's to do with your art practice, getting different teaching voices, whether it's to do with your personal development, lots of different voices. And you can filter out the bits that make sense. That's exactly what, what I did. But while I was going through that whole process, it was 
that I was given a sense of, of failure, that I wasn't able to achieve the results within these books because they almost felt like, it almost felt like there was an illusion created of how easy it was going to be that saying those affirmations in the mirror in the morning was going to be enough or just believing that you were going to have enough money or things were going to be all right and not encouraging patience, not encouraging a sense of knowing that the thoughts are part of it, but then you need to bring the thoughts into the three-dimensional world and create action as a result. Everything has its own place. And so I found a lot of the advice and assistance that people have given to me, it hasn't been rooted in reality, which I felt was not only misleading, but really unfair. It's almost like people have wanted to withhold the real information so you pay more money or so you feel like you can never quite get there and are constantly in a state of need or reliance on the person who's giving you the help and the assistance. And so I'm incredibly passionate in all of my work about bringing forth the realism alongside, woven together with optimism and hope. So there's the realism of where you are, and that is different for all of us. And there's the optimism and the potential for where you want to go. And there is a huge discrepancy of realism, reality and destination for all of us. We have so many different experiences that we're carrying with us, so many different energy levels, chemical levels, ability, desire, what is actively right for us rather than what we think is right for us. And oh boy, do I know a lot about that too. <laughs> As I've pursued the wrong avenue many times. My ego has been galloping ahead and my soul has said, hang on, that's not right for you. But I will let her go and trip over. She works well with trial and error. That's how she learns. That's the best advice we can give her. Let her fall flat on her face in the mud. Pick herself up, tears and all. Wash off the mud with salty tears and then she'll get back up and realise, oh, OK, that wasn't the right path. But I feel that if you can... And being aware of realism, your reality, where you are, what you're capable of where, right now, that is not a, a pessimistic or a negative situation at all. It's grounding. It's OK, this is me. And trying not to compare yourself to the version of yourself you want to be or the person who's next to you or the person you're looking at on Instagram and wishing that you could be where they are now, none of us can do that. We're all running our own race, not even running a race most of the time. But then the optimism and the hope of where you can go, knowing that with every person that you connect with who can assist you in a way that feels right, can assist you positively. If you can accept their, their help and, and they accept your help, if there's this wonderful synergy of friendship, of relationships within families, that's really powerful and really positive. Because it can be very difficult going against advice that we were given as children, it's so challenging discovering that you feel differently to the people who brought you up, your parents or the people immediately around you and your environment, your friends. I know my mother was absolutely terrified of rejection, of her children's rejection of her ideas. And it would have been very easy to have rejected a lot of her ideas, but I recognised how important it was for her 
to feel that she had a use. And very often the advice she gave, even though it could have been quite harsh, had just wonderful love and truth at the heart of it, even if it was coated with a few barbs. But that fear of rejection can trap us in cycles of ways of behaving, only adhering to one set of advice, one set of rules, because we can feel afraid of being kicked out of the tribe, left out in the cold, unsure of what our identity is going to be if we no longer fit in with the all of the ethics, the morals, the ideas, the concepts that surround the bubble that we are born into. Developing your own ideas, listening to so many different voices, picking and choosing the advice that feels right for you to accept and always questioning the negative and defensive reactions and understanding where they come from. Those are the ways in which we can really grow and develop a sense of self and have this calm, lasting, positive change journey become possible. Yeah, and humour. <laughs> humour is always helpful. A little bit of knowing self-awareness goes a very long way even if you can't laugh about it at the time. Developing that perspective, being able to look back on your journey and saying, wow, <laughs> I'm glad I'm not crying over my kale anymore. Look how far I've come. If that's the marker, I'm doing well. And Mary was able to accept the love and assistance from her family that they so desperately wanted to give her and she's made the most remarkable recovery and has been able to see her relationships with her family in a very different way as a result. I mean, this is all good news, but the reality, the realism of the situation, it's got a few spikes in it. And allow yourself to have doubts and to feel rubbish at times and know that it's going to change and you've got that destination you want to go to. Maybe you'll have a few side steps on the way and trip over a few rocks, just as I did. But it's worth it because each time you get up, you see things slightly differently. It's been so helpful for me to talk about this again and just to refresh my own mind on the whole concept of receiving and giving advice and love because here I am giving advice and assistance maybe I'm just giving it to a younger version of myself but really I hope that in some way I can connect with you and offer another voice where a few words might resonate maybe you'll have been angry through the whole video <laughs> and you'll question why and that's just as positive from my perspective. All right, thank you so much for your time. Thanks, Mary. Cheers for all the wine. Look forward to seeing you soon. I look forward to seeing you soon too. Bye.